in just a moment. Here in Ephesians chapter number one, we are going once again verse by verse. Now, as we continue with our study of the book of Ephesians, I can't guarantee that we will be going verse by verse the whole time. There may be a point in time through our study where we take a couple verses at a time. Uh, but right now, the Lord has laid out my heart to go verse by verse because as we have seen in this first chapter, this introductory chapter, or the beginning of this letter to the Ephesians, there are some very important things that Paul points out. And as we said when we first started, he first off gives us in verse number one who he is as the author. He states it, so it's clearly known. He states who this letter is to, so that uh, those who are receiving it know this is for them, and so that we as Christians in the 21st century know who he was writing to. And then he goes ahead in verse number two, and he wishes them well. He wishes them grace and peace. And then in verse number three, he jumps right into his first sentence, which covers verses three, four, five, and six, and he gives us some principles that are very important. Now, we're not going to go over those principles once again, but remember that everything that Paul is writing here in this letter to the Ephesians is to help them have unity. Because remember, as we have seen in our study already, this is the church that he, when he started there, he was used by God on his missionary journey to start it, that was faced with opposition, great opposition by those who were uh, silversmiths, those who built the, the uh, idols or the shrines uh, for the goddess Diana. And then remember, before he went back to Jerusalem, prior to going to Rome, he called the elders of this church together and warned them that there was going to be division. There was going to be people who rose up and who were going to try to cause problems and cause division and, and try to get people to follow them. And so he wanted to bring this church uh, back into a united state once again. He wanted to get everybody on the same page. And I know I said this last Wednesday night, but I really don't think I could reiterate it enough as your pastor. If we are not united, the only thing else we can be is divided. There's only one or two things. Uh, just like it's black or it's white, just like it's right or it's wrong, we are either a united body or we are a divided body. We're either all on the same page or we're all on different pages. And if we're all on different pages, that means we're doing our own thing. That means we're like the book of Judges. Brother, jo uh, Brother Davis and I were out talking today, and we had referenced the book of Judges, how that the Bible says there that every man did that which was right in his own eyes. Hey, it's important that we are on the same page tonight. It's important that as a church, we are headed the same direction, that we have the same goal, which is to bring people to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. And we'll get into talking about that here in just a moment. Back to verse number seven now, if you would. We started looking at the next uh, sentence of Paul here in this opening chapter, and we talked about how that it goes from uh, verse number 7 to verse number 12. And just real quickly by way of introduction, I want to point out a couple of words that we talked about over the last couple of services. First off, in verse number 7, we talked about the word redemption, where it says, "...in whom we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of His grace." Now. The forgiveness of sins, that phrase that's in between those commas, you, uh, you could say that's a definition of redemption. We are redeemed. That means that we're forgiven of our sins. And so really, you could, if you wanted to get a, a, a complete understanding, because sometimes when you have those phrases that are interjected there, it, it causes some confusion. But if you wanted to get a complete understanding of what Paul was saying there, he's saying in verse number 7, "...in whom we have redemption through his blood, according to the riches of his grace." It's by the riches of God's grace or according to the riches of his grace that you and I have redemption tonight. Remember, we said that redemption is repurchasing of something that has been taken captive. Uh, I was thinking about this illustration this afternoon. Let me grab this microphone real quick. I was thinking about my dog, Princess. And I was thinking about the fact that I am blessed to have uh, good neighbors on both sides. Uh, but, you know, my dog, like everybody's dog, gets riled up every once in a while. And if my neighbor was upset at me and said to me, you know what? If your dog ever comes over into my yard, that dog's mine. I'm not giving it back to you. I would probably keep an eye on that dog. I'd keep an eye on Princess. But let's say my neighbor went ahead and one day, because my neighbors on both sides have chickens, 
decided they were going to open the gates and leave the gates open so Princess could get in. Because they were, one of my neighbors might be really upset at me because maybe I left the trash can right in front of their driveway and they couldn't get out. I don't know, but then maybe they got really upset at me and they decided we're going to leave the gate open. Because we know that that dog's going to come running in here after the chickens. And as soon as that dog comes in, we're shutting the gate. And then that dog is ours. You know, I would go over there and I would try to talk to my neighbor. And I, I'd try to make it right and do whatever I could to get my dog back. Because my kids would be crying. I probably wouldn't be crying too much. But my kids would be crying saying, Daddy, we need Princess back. And so I'd go over there, and if they hadn't already killed my dog or eaten my dog or done something with my dog, I'd go over there and I'd try to get my dog back. Now, with all that in mind, if I got Princess back, you know what I could say? I could say that I redeemed her. I took some, I, I went and I paid the price to get something back that already belonged to me, but something that was taken captive from me. And we said that we belong to God because God created all of us. And it doesn't matter whether, uh, whether a person acknowledges that God created us or not. We all belong to God because he created us. And we have been taken captive by Satan through sin. When we sinned, the first time we sinned, we became a captive of Satan's. Because of that sin, we made a choice. We willingly sin. And so now we are no longer in God's backyard anymore. We are in the devil's, if that makes sense, using that illustration. The devil had, and someone might say, well, it's not fair. The devil tempted me. Well, that's exactly what he did with Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. He tempted them to do it, but they ultimately did it. And that neighbor of mine could have left that gate open and said, well, if princess comes in here, she's mine. But ultimately, a princess is the one who decided whether or not she was going into that yard. Yeah, maybe the chickens were out. Yeah, maybe the gate was open. But she made that decision. And then she became a captive in somebody else's yard. And when you and I sinned for the very first time, we became captives of Satan. We became captives or prisoners of his. And so when Jesus Christ died on the cross of Calvary and he shed his blood, he redeemed us. In other words, he repurchased us. He bought us back. Now, one thing I didn't mention when we looked at this word of redemption is it says in whom we have redemption. Now, God redeemed us, meaning we belong to him because he created us. And he redeemed us, which means he bought us back. So he paid for us to get back something that was already his. He redeemed us. But this says we have redemption. That means that we have our freedom back. Because someone that is taken captive loses their freedom. They are a prisoner. But we have redemption, which means we have liberty. It means we have freedom. It means that we are no longer prisoners. Not only that, think back to the Garden of Eden. I was sharing this with Brother Davis the other day. Think back to this. When Adam and Eve sinned, not only did they lose their freedom, but they also lost their innocence. Because before they sinned, they were innocent. In God's eyes, they were innocent. But as soon as they sinned, they were guilty. And so when God redeemed us, he gave us back our innocence. The blood of Jesus has washed us so that when God looks at us, he doesn't see a guilty, rotten, filthy, low-down sinner. He sees us redeemed, innocent. He sees us free. Why? Because of the blood of Jesus Christ. Now, going on to verse number 8, we talked about last Wednesday night, wisdom and prudence. So the grace of God is rich to us because he's bought us back. He's given us our liberty. He's given us our innocence once again, but also because he has given us wisdom and prudence. And we use the example of the knife, that wisdom is the right use of knowledge, that Knowledge says a knife has a sharp side and a dull side. That's knowledge. I know that a knife has a sharp side and a dull side. Right use of knowledge or wisdom is trying to cut something with the sharp side. If I tried to cut something with the dull side, that would be the opposite of wisdom or the opposite of, of being wise, which is foolishness or being a fool. Then we talked about prudence. That prudence 
is taking that knowledge, using it correctly, using it uh, uh, rightly as far as wisdom, and then being cautious and figuring out the best way to accomplish the goal that we have. And I use the illustration of taking a tomato and, and I, wanting a, a slice of tomato on a sandwich. If I want a slice of tomato on a sandwich, I'm not going to cut it right down the middle because then I'm going to have two big halves. And neither one of them is going to fit on my sandwich. I have to be, uh, be prudent about how I'm going to cut that tomato. And I have to think about it. And I have to go about it cautiously, knowing what is the best way to accomplish that goal, to get a nice thin slice of tomato for my sandwich. God has given us wisdom. He has given us prudence. And it's in the form of the Word of God. It's in the form of the Holy Spirit of God. He's not only redeemed us. He's not only saved us. He's not only given us liberty and given us uh, our innocence again. But He's given us a guide. He's given us someone to direct us. He's given us someone to comfort us. The Holy Spirit of God. The Word of God. Which is the sword of the Spirit. Then we go on now to our next verse. Verse number 9. And remember... That all of these, these verses work together because this is one sentence, but they all work together. And verse number nine says, having made known unto us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure. Now that phrase good pleasure means his delight, his delight in us. So he's made known unto us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, according to his delight, which he hath purposed. In himself. He's purposed it. He's planned it. He already planned that he was going to uh, make known the mystery of his will. Now, what does that mean? The mystery of his will. Well, to illustrate it tonight, we're going to play a little game. All right. We all like games, right? Brother Ross, you want to come help me real quickly? I've got these papers for you. I'm going to have Brother Ross hand these out, all right? There should be enough for everybody to have one. This is a game that you're probably familiar with. Because whenever you think of the word mystery, what game do you think of? Clue. Clue. All right. So I've got the, the clue cards up here. As soon as you get those out to everybody, brother, I'm going to have you come back up here. And I'm going to go ahead and have you hand out these clue cards as well. All right? So I'm going to pick... If you don't know how to play Clue, I'm going to explain it real quickly. All right, I'm going to pick out one suspect. I'm going to pick out one place, and I'm going to pick out one weapon. All right, now I'm going to take the ones that I didn't select, the three cards I didn't select, and I'm going to mix them up. And we're going to hand them out here in just a moment, and we're going to use this as an illustration real quickly. All right, so got those handed out, brother? Almost. All right. All right. Hurry, hurry, hurry. And I'm going to take the three cards that I have. And I'm going to look at them because I need to know the answer. All right. And I'm going to put them right here in our little envelope. All right. Okay. Brother Ross, you, everybody's got one? Come back up here, brother. And I want you to hand everybody a card. Give everybody a card. All right. Here you go. All right. Make sure everybody gets a card real quickly. As he's doing that, go ahead and look back here with me, if you would. You, you, wanna, you can't pick who you get to be, Brother Davis, all right? Look back to Mark chapter number 4. Hold your place here. Mark chapter number 4 and in verse number 11. Mark chapter number 4 and verse number 11. The Bible says here... And he said unto them, talking about his 12 disciples, Jesus is speaking here, unto you it is given to know the mystery of the kingdom of God, but unto them that are without, all these things are done in parables, that seeing they may see and not perceive, and hearing they may hear and not understand, lest at any time they should be converted and their sins should be forgiven them. All right, so Jesus is talking to his disciples. He's just given this parable. It's the parable of the sower. Remember, he talks about how someone, a man went out and he sowed seed on four different types of ground and how that the seed was uh, taken, the seed that fell by the wayside, how that the, the birds came down and they ate it. Then you had some that fell on the stony ground. And because it didn't, uh, it didn't get down into the earth, there was no roots in it. So when the sun came out, it burnt that, 
the, the plant that came out of that seed. And then you have the third type, which is the thorny ground. And remember that the thorns grew up and choked it or killed it. And then finally, you have the good ground. And the good ground is the only one that produced fruit. That's the only one where the seed took and it produced fruit. And so he gives this example. And then when he's with his disciples later on, he tells them in verse 11, unto you it is given to know the mystery of the kingdom of God, but unto them that are without all these things are done in parables. So he talks about the mystery of God, or excuse me, the mystery of the kingdom of God. Now, when we go back to Ephesians chapter number one and verse number nine, Paul refers to this as the mystery of God's will. Now, if you know anything about English, you know that when you have that word of, that preposition, that it can be used, it's used in place of the apostrophe S. For example, if I say, uh, this is David's pen, I could also say this is the pen of David, meaning that it belongs to him. So when it talks about the mystery here, the mystery is the mystery of God's will, or it's his will's mystery. There's a mystery about the will of God and what God wants. Let, let me show you here real quickly in a few other passages before we get into our illustration. Romans chapter number uh, 11, verse number 25. Romans chapter number 11 and verse number 25. The Bible says here, for I would not, brethren, that ye should be ignorant of this mystery, lest ye should be wise in your own conceits, conceits, that blindness in part is happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. And so all Israel shall be saved as it is written, there shall come out of Sion the deliverer and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. For this is my covenant unto them when I shall take away their sins. So here Paul references the mystery and he says, I would not have you to be ignorant of this mystery. Turn over to Romans chapter number 16 and verse number 25. Romans chapter number 16 and verse number 25. Here Paul writes, Now to him that is of power to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery which was kept secret since the world began, but now is made manifest, and by the scriptures of the prophets, according to the commandment of the everlasting God, made known to all nations for the obedience of faith, to God only wise, be glory through Jesus Christ forever. Amen. So in Mark, we saw that the mystery referenced the will, or excuse me, the kingdom of God. Paul calls it in Ephesians 1, the mystery of the will of God. We're told in Romans 11 that he didn't want them to be ignorant of this mystery. In other words, you need to know what this mystery is, what the mystery of the kingdom of God or the mystery of God's will is. And then here in verse number 25 of Romans 16, he says, uh, according to the revelation of the mystery, which was kept secret since the world began, but now is made manifest and by the scriptures of the prophets, according to the commandment of the everlasting God, made known to all nations for the obedience of faith. So what is this mystery? And why, is, why was it a mystery? Well, let's use our illustration real quickly to try to explain this. So everybody has a checklist, right? What'd you do with the extra cards, brother? Were there any extra cards? Why don't you bring them up here real quickly with me? All right, so we're going to play a quick version of Clue. It's so quick. We don't have the board, we don't have the dice, we don't have the pieces. So you can be Professor Plum if you want, Brother Davis, but really it doesn't matter. Although if you're Professor Plum, you may be in trouble if he is the murderer, right, in this instance. All right, so I want you to, if you don't know how to play Clue, remember as you find out one of these cards that we have, as it said, you're going to mark it off. And the one that the person, the suspect, the weapon in the room that do not get marked off, that's your answer right there, okay? So the first card I have here is the knife, all right? So mark the knife off. The second card I have here is the candlestick. So mark the candlestick off. And the third card I have here is the wrench. So mark the wrench off. Somehow we got all three weapons all in a row. All right, now we're going to go around the room, and you're going to share your card with us one at a time. Misty, the lead, pipe. the lead pipe. So mark the lead pipe off. All right, Brother Wagner. Miss Peacock. All right, so she's innocent. Mark her off. Miss Wagner? Professor Plum. Professor Plum, you escaped Professor Plum. All right. 
He did not do it. You can mark him off. Brother Reed. Mr. Green. Mr. Green didn't do it either. All right, mark him off. Brother Daniel. The lounge. The lounge. It did not happen in the lounge. You can mark that off. Brother Josh, do you have a card? The revolver. So the revolver was not the weapon. Sister G. Colonel Mustard. Colonel Mustard. Mark Colonel Mustard off. All right. So do you guys already have a weapon? Yes, yeah, I already have the weapon. Okay, just checking because I'm not following along with you. I'm not marking them off. Brother G, what did you have? Mrs. White. Mrs. White. So mark Mrs. White off. So let's see here. Mrs. Peacock has been absolved. Mr. Green, Professor Plum. Mrs. White, has it, nobody said Colonel Mustard or Miss Scarlet yet, right? Yeah. Oh, you did? Oh, you got Colonel Mustard. So you already got the suspect in, right? Yes, All right, so we got to finish out and find out where it happened. Brother Ross. Uh, dining, room. dining room. All right, in the dining room. You, or it was not in the dining room, excuse me. Miss Caitlin. Kitchen. kitchen. Mark the kitchen off. All right, Miss Davis. Study. The study. All right, wasn't in the study. Brother Davis. In the hall. It wasn't in the hallway, so. He's lying. He's, he's lying? Why? Because you have the hall? No, he has the hall. Oh, Brother Davis. What a, a cheater. The ballroom, you can mark off. And Brother James, you had the hall? All right, so mark off the hall. Mark off the ballroom. Miss Rita, do you have one? Billiard room. All right, mark off the billiard room. So we're down to two options, right? What are the two options? Library. Library or? Conservatory. Conservatory. All right, Miss Daisy, what do you have? Library. Library. Okay, so our answer should be Miss Scarlett, right? In the conservatory with the rope, correct? Yes. All right, so now if I had asked one of you to leave before we had, before I had pulled the cards out and revealed it, you would have had a very, very, very good idea what the answer was because we went through all the cards and you have your checklist and there was only three that weren't checked. But until you actually saw me pull the cards out and until you actually saw those three cards, you wouldn't have known for sure that that was the answer. All right. Now, when the Bible here in Ephesians chapter number one talks about the mystery of his will. Remember that the Bible says that God, the Lord is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. The Lord's will is that every man everywhere should be saved. Now, when Adam and Eve sinned in the Garden of Eden, God made sure that he put clues in the Word of God, and he put clues in the history of man to help us understand that this was his will, that no man should die and go to hell. He also put clues throughout the Bible, throughout the Old Testament, throughout Judaism, which is the, the faith of the Jews, to help us prepare for the way of salvation, which is Jesus Christ. Remember, just turn back with me real quickly, if you would, to Genesis chapter number 3. Genesis chapter number 3, because I want you to see this real quickly. Obviously, we don't have time to cover every clue given by God in the Bible. But let's just look at the very first one. Since here in Genesis chapter number 3, we have the very first sin or the fall of mankind by Adam and Eve when they sinned in the Garden of Eden. Look at Genesis chapter number 3 and in verse number 21. Genesis chapter number 3 and verse number 21, the Bible says, Unto Adam also and to his wife did the Lord God make coats of skins and clothe them. Now, remember after Adam and Eve sinned in the Garden of Eden, they realized that they were naked. And remember, before they had sinned, they didn't realize this because they didn't have a knowledge of good and evil. And remember that the Bible says during the creation that God would create things, and then at the end of the day, he'd look back on it and he'd see that everything that he had created was good. And so when God created Adam and Eve, he had not, and he created them in the state that they were in. At the end of Genesis chapter number 2, where it says that they were naked, this was not evil. This was not wrong. This was good because the way that God had created them was the way that he intended for them to be at that time. And so it was good. But when they gained that knowledge of good and evil and they realized their nakedness, that's when they realized they, they decided to make uh, aprons for themselves. 
And I've used the illustration before when we were talking about clothing and modesty, how that if you make, if you take an apron and you make an apron for yourself, an apron doesn't cover you entirely. And so here in Genesis chapter number three and verse number 21, the Bible says that God did not like what they had made for themselves. And so he went above and beyond and he made for them coats. I like to think of uh, those fur coats that the ladies like to wear. Those fur coats that ladies wear, they'll go all the way down and they cover you fully from your shoulders on down. And the Bible says here that God made them coats. Now, when he made them coats, he was giving them a clue as to salvation and the way of salvation. In other words, it was going to require the life of someone or something. It was going to require the shedding of blood because when God gave them coats of fur, he had to kill something. Blood had to be shed in order for them to be clothed. We put, when we get saved, when we put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ, we put on a robe of righteousness. It's not our righteousness. It's his. And so God gave that very first clue right here in verse number 21. He gives another clue in verse number 24. And we talked about this either last Wednesday night or the Sunday before it. That God said that man couldn't go back into the garden because if he went back in there, there was still a tree in the midst of the garden next to the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. It was called the tree of life. And if Adam went in there and took the fruit off that tree and ate it, he would live forever. That's what God said. And so in verse number 24, it says, So he drove out the man, and he placed at the east of the Garden of Eden cherubims, messengers, angels, and a flaming sword which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. This, we said that this uh, sword turned in every direction. So you could not get past this sword if you wanted to. You probably couldn't get past the angels anyhow because one angel was able to defeat uh, thousands of men by himself. But if you got past the angel, you wouldn't be able to get past this sword that's spinning in every direction. And it's a fiery sword. And this is a symbol. This is symbolic. The way back to eternal life. The tree of life. And Jesus was the, is the tree of life. The way back into the garden, the way back into that relationship with God, you have to go through the flaming sword. The sword is a representation of the Word of God. And remember the Bible says that the Word became flesh, talking about Jesus Christ. Also, the flame there is a representation of the Holy Spirit as you uh, let the sword pierce you. That flaming sword, the sword of the Spirit pierce you, the Word of God. Then you get saved because faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. And so here we have a second clue. After kicking them out of the Garden of Eden, God gives them a second clue. And we could go throughout, throughout the Bible. We could go to Egypt when the Passover occurred. And he told them to take a lamb and to kill the lamb and to put the blood on the doorpost. And remember, I showed you before that if you were to take that blood and you were to put it over the doorpost and some people say that they think the blood over the doorpost looked like that and i've told you that may have been how it was but if i knew that my son or my daughter my firstborn that their life was on the line hey i'm taking that blood and i'm going as high as i can and i'm going across as far as i can to make sure that blood overlaps because if there wasn't blood over the doorpost and on the side of the doorpost the angel of god was going to come through and take that firstborn and when you do that, what do you have? You have a door between two crosses, symbolic of Jesus Christ, who said, I am the way, who said, I am the door between two crosses, the two thieves. All throughout the Old Testament, God gives clue after clue after clue that salvation is available for all of mankind, that eternal life is free and it's there and there's a way to get it. And it's through the death, the shedding of blood the burial, the resurrection of His Son, Jesus Christ. Real quickly, turning back with me, if you would, to Ephesians as we get ready to close here. Ephesians chapter number 5. Ephesians chapter number 5 and verse number 32. I want you to look here real quickly at what Paul says about the mystery once again. And he mentions the mystery a couple times, and three times, in fact, in chapter number 3. But in Ephesians chapter number 5 and verse number 32, look at what the Bible says. It says, this is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ in the church. Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife even as himself and the wife see that she reverence her husband. Remember how that here earlier in this chapter, in chapter number 5, he said that 
the Lord Jesus Christ gave himself, loved the church and loved, uh, loved us so much that he gave himself for us and that a husband ought to love his wife in the same manner. Once again, depicting for us what that mystery is. Back in, in the Old Testament, they had these clues throughout the Old Testament. And God gave them these clues, but they had to put it all together to figure out what uh, was the way for salvation. How were they going to end up in heaven? How could they get there? It was through faith in Jesus Christ. And finally, when the cross of Calvary occurred and, and Jesus went to the cross and he was crucified, it was revealed. It was like opening the envelope. And putting all of the clues together throughout the Old Testament, there's uh, hundreds of messianic prophecies, prophecies about the Messiah. And finally, there when Jesus Christ came to this earth, and when he lived his life and he died on that cross, he fulfilled every prophecy. In other words, you could go down the checklist and figure out that Jesus was and is the Savior of the world. Now, with all that in mind, in Ephesians chapter number 6 and verse number 19, Paul references the mystery once more and he says, And for me that utterance may be given unto me that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel. Tonight, the mystery of the gospel, the mystery of God's will that he wants everyone to be saved. He doesn't want anyone to perish. He doesn't want anyone to go to hell. That salvation is free and it's there and it's available to everybody. It's been revealed. It's open. The envelope's been opened. The checklist has been done. And the answer is Jesus. Amen. Now with all that said, tonight after we got done with our game, and let's say that we played a real game of Clue tonight. Let's say we were sitting down and we were playing a real game of Clue. And I got to, we got to the end, and I said, oh, oh, I think I know who did it. I think it was Miss Scarlett with the rope in the conservatory. You know the rules of Clue, right? You take, if you make a guess, you take the envelope, you open it up, you check it. If you're wrong, you put the cards back in, and you don't say anything, and you're out of the game. But if you're right, you lay the cards out to show everybody that you were right. Let's say we were playing that game tonight, and I made that guess, and I laid the cards out, and I said, there it is. It's the answer. And you were over there with your checklist, and you're going, i got to figure this out. Who did it? I don't have who did it yet. I have the weapons. I have the rooms. I don't have who did it. I'd say to you, what's wrong with you? I just laid the cards out. The answer's right here. I, I, I already showed you the answer. I got it right. But you know what? There's a lot of people in our world tonight that it's already been revealed. Jesus is the answer. But they're still looking at the checklist going, i got to figure it out. I'm telling you what, folks, I am shocked how many people I have talked to in the last three weeks who I've knocked on their door and I've asked them, do you know you're going to heaven when you die? And they have no idea. They have no answer because they're still looking at the checklist. Hey, it's already been revealed. Jesus is the answer. But they don't know the answer because they're still looking at their checklist. Well, maybe if I'm a good person. Well, maybe if I get baptized. Maybe if I get back into church. And they're trying to figure out the answer. And the answer's already been revealed. It's Jesus. We talked to someone last week. I think I may have even mentioned this uh, in one of the services. Knocked on one person's door. Nice lady. But I, uh, she said she had grown up in this church or, or uh, grown up in this denomination for 70 years. And when I asked her, do you know you're going to heaven when you die? She said, you know what? I really don't know much that about, that much about the Bible. You need to talk to my pastor. He went to divinity school. And I thought to myself, wait a second, you don't know that you're going to heaven when you die? Why would you stay in that church or that type of church for 70 years if they can't even tell you where you're going when you die? It's not a mystery. It was a mystery, but the envelope's been open and it's revealed Jesus is the answer. Now, what should that do for me? As Paul said in Ephesians 6, 19, it ought to cause me to want to open my mouth boldly and to make known the mystery of the gospel. And tonight, back in Ephesians 1 and verse number 9, he says, having made known unto us the mystery of his will, we know what God wants. He wants everybody to be saved. We know how God wants to accomplish it through his son, Jesus Christ. We just got to get out there and tell people. We have to let them know. 
You folks, you've been, a number of you have been in church long enough. You've heard the illustration before. If someone had cancer and you had the remedy for cancer, you had the cure, then if you did not go out and share it, you'd be looked down upon. You'd be frowned upon. People would say that you're selfish, that you won't share it is wrong and, and, and it's wicked. And yet here we are. We've got the answer. We know the cure. We know who can save. And are we opening our mouth and sharing it? And we ought to be promoting the Lord Jesus Christ, proclaiming the Lord Jesus Christ, preaching the Lord Jesus Christ, wherever, whenever, to whomever we can. Let's pray. Father, thank you for all that you've done for us. Thank you for all that you've given to us. Father, I thank you so much for revealing the mystery of your will to us.